What I wanted to say to you today is a, is a number of things. When you come to classrooms and you have those little pretty, little pretty things in front of you, you want there to what? For them to get something out of your presence there, right? What do you think I want? <laughs> it's just a never-ending chain of pain. <laughs> I want from you to learn from me. You want from them to learn from me. Their parents want them to learn from them. And what do they do? They live their quiet, happy lives. <laughs> and they deal with us as much as they have to. All of us. You with me, me with someone else, and so on. just goes on. Now, the difference is, as the parent would say, and I would say, and you would say, the difference is that I want you to see this unit as your professional development. Because really, not often in your life, even if you do PDs with, through the Department of Education, will you have access to academics that will actually help you enough. Some, I have actually run uh, professional development, especially in, and I cannot name because it's recorded where, but especially in the area of loads, teaching languages. And because they were run by the Department of Education, the Department of Education brought their own people as well, so that we have a collaborative setup. And I tell you one thing, the first time, the first, the first uh, workshop uh, I ran, all the teachers were absolutely delighted, happy, going bananas, just couldn't wait for the next one. But when we started bringing these people from outside who were just pouring information into their heads, and those people didn't speak English because <laughs> they forgot that they were there for a reason. They actually are teachers of foreign languages, and most likely their first language was not English. And this person stood there for three hours, brought these procedures about, um, what is it called? I don't, ha I, don't, I don't actually have anything against that particular uh, way of looking at um, uh, what I used to teach it all the time. Anyway, it's about curriculum something or other, it doesn't matter. The point was, it, every item had 35 sub-items. And those people from Asia were sitting and thought, not yet another PD. Do you think we ran that PD next time? I mean, after this funding finished, we could have applied for a second funding to, to run the second part of it. Nobody wanted to do it. But that's a real life. Very often you get people from those departments who actually, their role is political. And you'll be sitting through them, things, and not always you'll find them that exciting. So I think that here is a time that you have to actually Make it exciting together and learn some things and actually let your brain fly as opposed to nothing political here, especially with me. Nothing political is about letting your brain fly. And that's what I will be mainly assessing. So, there are a number of things today that I wanted to do, not many, but two of them. And what I wanted to do is to actually make you think whether you can understand text. And we started actually this work today already, didn't we? When um, raising the issue of teachers always coming with this big book, small book, I don't really care. I don't even know why it has to be a book. Can, the reason why I mention it, because I, I taught this unit, say, last year, and this woman was telling me that Caterpillar, whatever the story is, I'm not of English background, so I didn't do those little children books in English. It's about calendar. You couldn't tell if you actually looked at the book. When do you see, when you schedule your time, when you have a calendar, is your calendar like Monday on one page, Tuesday on the next page, Wednesday on the next page? Is it like that looking? Very often it's actually a table. It's later on, once you have an understanding that calendar is a table, and then you can actually spread it for each day you can give one page. But you know, actually, the real representation of a calendar is not a page, it's a table. There was no table in the Caterpillar book. How are the children to understand the concept of calendar when the way the calendar is introduced in the book by a artistic designer as a page for each day? How are they going to get it? 
No, but the teacher knows. We bought these books. We have these books. We give them to children. And you don't, you're not a slave to anything that someone else produced. You can go to Google, get the text of, from, of Caterpillar from Google, pretty it, put it in a PowerPoint or something like that, and work with it. Give children the book, for sure. But when you work in classroom, you don't have to work with a print, printed book that you just bought or school bought. Children can have it, and they can look for themselves just for the fun of it, but you work with something that actually enables you to reflect the kinds of relationships you want to actually sensitize children to. Right? And nowadays, unlike me, because <laughs> I'm old enough to actually, I mean, I was born last century, a long time ago. Unlike us, I mean, my husband, my husband, not even an uncle or grandfather, my husband typed his PhD. And people like, oh, most of it he actually, you know, if you type, if you make a mistake, what happens? Now, if you type on the typewriter, sorry, oh. you forgot about it. It was well yeah. before your mother was born. On the typewriter, <laughs> you've got to retire the whole page because you can only make this many corrections. Whereas if you want to have a caterpillar text, what do you do? You go to Google, you ask for a caterpillar text, and then there it is, typed. Some other beautiful soul has already typed it for you. All you have to do is copy and paste, decorate it, arrange it in ways that you want to actually work with this particular text. And what do we say in English? Bob is your uncle. So, um, so the children, in order to actually understand the concept of calendar, if you actually rep reproduce it then as a table, you can actually give it to them page by page, and then you can actually entice them to actually put it together. Or you do it yourself. Either way, the point is you produce different representations of, let's call it, meaning or relate of whatever you want to actually children to say. So what I'm saying is, when we were talking about do we understand text and what do we do when we don't understand one, we don't really understand this methodology by Ockerman, but she talks about dialogue. She mentions some guy, well, how about if I see whether Winch talks about the same people and the same concept? How do you find out in Winch, whether Winch talks about dialogue and Bakhtin? How do you find out? You have, you've got the Winch textbook. I mean, I, I strongly... I said to you, you don't have to buy it, but say that you bought it because it was relevant for some other units. You've got, you've got Ockerman. You didn't understand really everything. So what you do, you don't read Ockerman till the cows come home and have a heart attack at the end. You look for another text. Simple, isn't it? Simple. We do it. So you think, okay, textbook should do. Textbook, if it... Anya says we, sh we should be critical about it. It should be like a dictionary. There, ha there have to be some things covered. Okay, so how do you look for a dialogue and bucked in, in which? Right, as opposed to for week one, we had chapter five. You read chapter five ten times because meaning you have to extract the meaning from the text, right? And there ain't any dialogue or no bucked in. But either you continue reading, huh. you do that. You go to the index, you go, Winch, you have no dialogue and definitely no back team. Or Winch, what's wrong with you? <laughs> well, it could be uh, many things. And it's not necessarily the time, because back team was contemporary to Vygotsky, so died a long time ago. <laughs> All right, so it could be many things. But that's how you look. You look. So if you need to expand or understand a text, you look into other texts and you have particular literacy skills that enable you to find information. Where? Can you think about using the same principle in your classroom? When they don't get something, we look into other texts, we teach them literacy skills in order for them to find those things. Isn't that lovely? How different from reading the text over and over and over. And most of the time what I get from students who, um, in other units and whatever, what I get is, I will, read, I, I will read the text to the child. The module is reader, it's not listener. <laughs> right? The module is reader. But 
Look, you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it for yourself, what I can do for you. I will read it for you. <laughs> and they love you even more. The point is, they don't become readers. You are hoping that they are good boys and girls. And they have a concept of listening for 10 minutes or half an hour to you reading. But they just came to the class. They tired. They didn't sleep all night. They were busy dreaming. <laughs> Mom didn't see it. And they were on iPad all night. They fell asleep on it. I have no problem with that. Whatever. The point is, you don't always get that romantic picture. <laughs> okay, so, so what did we say the principle was? We, when we don't understand something, we looked elsewhere and we utilized literacy skills in order to actually find what we're looking for. Right, it starts at 5. It doesn't start at 50. Okay, so that's a good thing. So, do we understand text? Do we understand text? We have a discussion where we understand text. It's a totally uncommitted, uncommitted discussions, which means you could actually say anything. But are you? Do we understand text? you extract meaning and you got it and you know what this text is about? If that was happening, why would people talk about different interpretation of a text? You know, like we make sure that children get the meaning out of that story, they really get it. The point is, if that was the case in real life, why would people have a different approach to reading a particular text? Oh, well, it happens later on when they are literary critics or something. Oh, really? And how did those literary critics learn to be literary critics? Well, not in high school, because we still have to make sure that they understand the meaning. What about university? Well, definitely not, because they just have to get the knowledge. So when did they learn it? Well, there are two ways. They went to Harvard, <laughs> or they just got sick and tired with everything. <laughs> and just started re-educating themselves. Right? They either dropped out of school when they were 14, or they, at some stage, decided they're just going to take their life in their own hands, as opposed to giving it always to the teacher, someone else. And someone else is only a human being. Remember how I made the point? I always make a point. Everything, everybody is a human being. We can't put expectations on them that they'll produce the manual. So, do we understand text? Do you understand me? Did you see how many interpretations happened on learning of what I said in class? You should read it. There are some things I never said. But that's the idea. That's the idea. You get it out of yourself. You verbalize. There is no shame. Here, we are learning. It's like the gym. You know, in the gym, you can look really un happy, but when you go out and you wear a mini dress because that unhappiness translated in you feeling cool, <laughs> right? Um, so that's the play. Here's our gym, you know, the sort of environment where we can actually do these things. All right, so do we understand text? Sure we do. Our way. And that's all you can do. And the little key who interprets lion and the mouse story their way is okay. What happens, this is the thing, and I'm, I'm just going to, lead, I'm leading to it because we will be covering it today. What happens if you, as typically it is encouraged to happen, when you say to children, so what's the moral of the story of the lion and the mouse? I know it because I was exposed to it so many times that I actually almost know it by heart. So what happens, the, the teacher is almost compelled to come up with a summary of the thing and says, well, okay, so what did we learn? What's the moral of it? Oh, we're introducing the concept of moral. That's cool. Now, children, what, what's the moral? And what do children say? What's the moral of the lion and the thing? Any moral? You've read that thing? Oh. <laughs> the moral is that sometimes we should not ignore people because we think we have prejudice about them. 
sometimes they can be actually very helpful. So the mouse saves the life of the lion. Right? A lion had a prejudice. The lion said, someone like you, how would that be that you could ever be of value to me? And the mouse little is big. Now, so the teacher is really happy we covered that. We covered the point of the curriculum. That's what teacher thinks by misreading the curriculum. We've covered that there is a moral in the story, and we've covered the moral. The curriculum never said it. The curriculum does say you should actually sensitize children to how texts are structured and think critically and, and, and work with text creatively and all of that. It doesn't say brainwash them and leave them alone to repeat to you what you just said. It doesn't. Say it again. It doesn't you can or you can't. Okay, so, exactly. So what happens, this is where I'm going to go. First of all, you don't have to tell them that that story has a moral. You can actually, you're 20 years old or 30 years old or 40, you can drag them there to think for themselves how texts are structured. And you'll be surprised how little you know about how texts are structured. They definitely don't have beginning, middle, and the end. Nobody ever has produced a text using the recipe that the text has to have a beginning and in the middle. Nobody. That's just misunderstanding. You couldn't, if I said to you create a novel using the structure beginning, middle, and the end, you wouldn't know where to start. Well, beginning, what does that mean? Well, you know, beginning. <laughs> so that's the first thing. One thing is to actually sensitize into the fact that there is structure. And why am I saying not to push them into the moral? Just like I'm saying not to push them to a particular interpretation of the moral. You, were, you said the word creativity. Why am I not doing that? Why am I saying get them going, get them into the dialogue, get the dialogue verbalized, get them think? Right, what does Ken Robinson say? What do schools do? A two-year-old can think of 3,000 words, Divergent. ways. Divergent, different. You know, you don't like it, they will say, the moral, I, I think it didn't have a moral. I think it just said that lions, and I couldn't think about what lions, blah, blah, because I'm already a product of schooling, right? I actually think that the moral of this, I mean, I've, we've, it be, it's been said so many times, so there's no way I can think of it differently. But in academic texts, I do it. I always question. I, when someone says, this is how it is, I'm thinking, why did you, how did, how did, why? How about if it is not? If we sort of went the other way, what would unravel then, right? So, yeah, and what will you lose if for two weeks these kids will go nuts and will be inventing 3,000 morals or 3,000 ways in which a text is structured? What will you lose? Nothing. What will you gain? People alive. <laughs> People who are then feeling that what they think is okay. Because what the school does, it says what you're thinking is nothing. You've got to now learn. And that's why one of my postgraduate students says, gave me this um, structure of how she thinks, and I crossed out learning, and she says, I love it, Anya. You cross out everything I ever know. <laughs> why call it learning? Oh, because I am there for you to learn from. You know? It's about knowledge construction, right? Engagement, informed engagement in the world. That's what we want, an informed engagement in the world. Forget the word learning. Use the word learning for other people. But for yourself, you should think about it, and even for texts with me. It's an informed engagement in the world. That's what we want. Call it learning if you want, but learning doesn't say anything. And yet evokes all this 19th century machinery of industrial uh, era. So, and it'd be amazing that you could actually introduce the concept of the moral, how other th people think about it. And you can engage them in a discussion about that particular structure. Now they talk from a position of strength. This is what I think the text is. You talk it has a moral, okay. If I were to accept your point of view, this is what I think. Now you create little Americans. They have a point of view. <laughs> 
why call it Americans? Because that's how my interactions with Americans are often like. They're very confident. They are taught very often to actually speak out, say, be confident about it, explore yours, but not necessarily from the position of weakness and I am uh, underneath your point of view. I'm engaging with you on an equal basis so that I understand, so that I grow. Anyone recognizes what it is? Yeah, have you seen that video on LearnLine? Has anyone seen that video on LearnLine? Okay, that video is on your LearnLine in the same place where the lectures are, I think. I posted that only about two days ago, so I don't require from you to be right there on time and have memorized this. The point is, it is a text-to-speech. No, it's actually a speech-to-text, sorry. Speech-to-text program free. Now, I'm not saying I chose the best one. There are better ones probably, and some of them your school can buy. The point was to show what is available. Have you used speech-to-text before? When you write in your portfolio, how I use literacy today. <clears throat> and you will not produce a list because I'm teaching you not to produce a list. It's actually I want you to say to me how your literacy, how you engage your literacy skills today. And it's not about I watch the iPod or whatever, iPhone or whatever. It's about how do, how do you con con construct yourself as a literate person and show me the evidence. You can say, haven't used yet speech to text. What does it say? You know it is out there. Why is it important? Because very often teachers tell me we don't use technology and I, when I ask them what is out there, they have no idea. Okay, that. okay. so talking about the literacy profile, yes, I know about speech to text, have never used it, Anya showed it, I tried. It's very interesting. I haven't used that for a while, so you will see when the video is running are you going but shopping? I wasn't doing it right, and I left it there Are for you everybody going else to see. You don't have to know how the thing works. You can work it out. Because very often people yes, say to I me, you've got to teach me. Yeah, I don't remember. Do you think I know how the PowerPoint works? Yes, Not only I that, am. they change all the time. I work it out as I go. And if I don't know, yes, I am. then I go to YouTube. And if PowerPoint yes, has am. things, I have no idea it does. I go to YouTube and I type tricks with PowerPoint. And you've got entire oh, channels no, I'm not. committed to tell you what you can squeeze out of that thing. It simply looks like a, um, just basically a page with, for text to be typed. So if you actually click on this doing? thing, it will... I'm going to school. See what I'm doing here wrong? Can you see it? I'm not enabling the um, I'm going online to system to process my speech because what happens, you see now, I allowed now, but it didn't actually read me. What happens, I have an accent and sometimes, because what happens, the server school. is somewhere else in the world. It takes time to process. And I was clicking, clicking, well, one thing, immediate response, right? Because we live in this country, school. immediate response. Speech text, speech not recognized, could be because of my accent, could be because of the server. Who knows? Wonderful tools I for ESL hate students. School. And after, after so many tries, when it said no, no, I accepted it because I'm thinking, oh, it's good enough. <laughs> Now, do you think it's a great tool for your classroom, for your little children? To see that someone is typing what they are saying? Do you don't think it's empowering? It's bloody empowering like anything, right? I don't have to write. I say it, writes it. No, it doesn't. You have to actually check, right? So you, it's a trick. They think the computer does it for them. Unfortunately, what you will not tell them, because you're a good mother and a good, you have good pedagogic skills, 
<laughs> whereby you have to a little bit outsmart those little things. You don't tell them they have to actually read because at the end of the day, they still have to check whether the computer said it right, typed it right, right? It's a reading thing. It's fine. So um, does it give children independence? It gives you also independence. They say and, and the computer types it, the text they want to say. So if there is children working in groups, you have 3,000 different texts. Or if you have 30 children in class or 20, you have 20 texts. Or if they are in groups, you have six texts. But it's not always continuously for five weeks the same text in the same book over and over. A little bit of independence, a little bit of empowerment, a little bit of excitement, and then you can think what you can do with that. <laughs> what can children then do once they got that thing done? They can have a story. They can actually create a story or a little dialogue. Then they can actually copy and paste it and create a little book out of it or a little poster or a little something and whatever. You see, very often, actually, I ask myself, and, I, and I'm not going to give you an answer. This is something you will ask yourself. I'm not going to give you an answer. I want you to think about it, and we can actually talk about it next week. But <clears throat> I told you that I often think, in order to actually, thinking is nothing else but going the other way than everybody says. So, for example, in primary, when you teach three, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, what do people start with? Alphabet. I'm not really sure. I'll and every morning at nine, they come to the uh, learning booth to participate in the cognitive experiments. I in the left, Ayumu in the right, facing to the computer. I touches kanji character to represent the number, uh, the color. Blue goes to this letter. And the reverse. So gray. And yellow. Sorry, very easy for Japanese. And Ayumu's son is learning to touch the Arabic numerals from small number to large number, one through 19. <laughs> and based on this knowledge of the order of numerals, uh, we invented a memory test. After touch one, the other numeral is gone. After touch one, the other numerals masked, but still he can touch two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah? One, two, three, four, five, six. Please try. One, two, three, four. Don't worry, no one can do it. <laughs> and the task is a little bit difficult. One and four are missing. Still, he can touch small number to large number in a very brief to, uh, presentation. I cannot explain. My students of Kyoto University, the accuracy is zero percent. <laughs> but the task is so demanding, very close to the threshold for this chimpanzee too, so he needs a concentration. <laughs> Completely lost. Look at this, he looks away. Ten seconds later, he can do it. So the memory continues at least for 10 seconds. After the test, I get into the booth to play with the chimpanzees. And what this researcher, this is all research in neuroscience, and what this researcher is showing 
that none of his students, none of adults, none of the postgraduate students can do the maths faster than a chimpanzee. And nobody understands it. Why? They call it the maths at the glance. He just looks at it and knows. So he can organize numbers from the highest to the lowest, from the lowest to the highest, at random, whatever you give him. There are moments, there was a moment when the chip got confused. It's very interesting, actually, for you as teachers. Why am I saying that to you? I'll tell you soon. Okay, so the, the, the chimp gets confused. What do you do when the child gets confused and can't read or can't organize something? What do you do? Typically, I don't want, to feel, I don't want you to feel challenged, so I will answer the question. Typically, what the teacher says, but Bob, focus. Bob, focus. What does this say? Right? That's what we do. Please focus. Read it again. Have a look. Do you know what the chimpanzee did when the chimpanzee got upset with himself that he was getting it wrong because the computer was stalling or whatever, like he got a signal of sorts? The chimp turned away from the computer, very Buddhist, turned away from the computer, refocused in himself, not on the problem, found the internal peace, Turned? I mean, it's amazing to watch. It's amazing. You can't even follow the logic as fast as the chimp does it. And the Japanese guy says, well, don't worry if you can't do it. None of my graduate students can do it. Nobody can beat the chimp with maths of that kind. I mean, obviously, maths is a cultural system, right? So when it gets to, you know, calculating the, dif the distance between the moon and the galaxy 277, it's a different story. But this kind of maths. What does it say? Why am I saying that? Because we are inculcated to a particular way of thinking how children process information. It could, might not be that way. That's why, and what happens in Western culture, and this is nothing bad about it, but that's what culture is. Culture becomes becomes a ritual when it's not dialogizing, right? A ritual is what we do. We do, we do, we do. It's not question. We do it. A culture can only be and grow when we actually engage with the other. We become civilized because we actually are not killing. We're engaging. We're thinking how that works and how, you know, see what I'm saying? There are different ways of actually thinking about oneself, about life, about knowledge, about existence, about everything. So the Western culture is a very material culture. You have Buddhist cultures which are not material cultures. Western culture looks for particles. Eastern cultures look for soul. What I'm saying here is allow for, if we do not know any other way, at least we understand that this is only a way. So the idea that we have to start teaching reading with alphabet, you say, you, I would say to myself, if I was 20, if I couldn't think of a different way, I would say to myself, okay, this is how we do it. I understand that this is only a practice. I'm sure there are other ways. At this very moment, I may not be actually ready to actually come up with a different way, but at least I have a distance to my own thinking. That's healthy. Because when you just run, 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 run <laughs> one way, you become a ritual. Okay, so that's a good thing, and I will remember that question, which is going to follow it through. There's something I was going to show you today, and I want you to start our thinking about the reader and text. That's what I'm doing today on this thing. And if you watch that video, it's on, it's on LearnLine, you will actually learn some things. Uh, but I'm point and hope like crazy that works. Now the text, forget the text, forget the. You know you're not gonna use it with five year olds. I was just playing. Through his expertise okay, in so remote let's hope that works. Over the week after flight, Marshall Islands 370 mysteriously vanished from Malaysian airspace. The 67-year-old asked his Twitter and Facebook followers to use their intuitive sense to work out where the plane may have crashed. Teller, 
the former friend of Michael Jackson, has championed remote viewing for years, stating that the series okay, you got the idea, right? The method you got for the decades. idea. What it did? You don't have that animation on your PowerPoint, I think. It's called Unfold. Sometimes they call it. Yeah, it's, un it's called Unfold. I basically I explain that through Facebook. I get all of these PowerPoints, you know, like nice pictures and whatever. What I do, rather than just run them, I stop them and then I actually open them through PowerPoint and look what's in them for me. <laughs> Sometimes there would be something like this. This is from a stolen from a French PowerPoint, but went all around the world. It's called Le Belle Photo, just like cats and you know different things. And it had a lot of tricks to make this presentation really beautiful. I learned how to make it go from the black and white into a color video. It's all cheating, right? Because there was only one photo. But you learn how to make the photo from black and white become color and backwards simply through animation. Um, and it also had this unfold, which is a sort of like a typewriter. It's a wonderful way to synchronize speech with writing. And children just go, Ooh. and you know what? I noticed because I use it also for my postgraduate students, just to make that when, when instead of actually showing the text on the PowerPoint, I sometimes do that. It's amazing how it helps them to actually, it makes them read and it makes them really focus because there's nothing else in the PowerPoint, just only as much as they got at the, with that sort of sequence. So you can make it with, you can, you, you can watch this, watch this video and you can see, because I mentioned some things you can, <clears throat> Kids can type it, you can type the text, however you want to use this particular technology if you want to use it. In the primary school or later, I would say very much in the primary school. Um, if you type it, the text, since you type it, you can use colors for different things. Typically what my teachers, my students, my pre-service students would say, well, just color consonants or vowels, yes. We will color word endings, okay. Do not color too much because it becomes really like that. Just focus in a particular text which you will actually want to. Sometimes what people actually underestimate that we are all music. All of us are just music. That's why we love music. So everything vibrates, everything, even the neurons in your head, everything. Sometimes children might actually get the grammar if you actually focus on the rhythmic aspect of the word or of the text. So you might actually highlight the things where the stresses are. You know, so you look somewhere else and yet you get that one done, right? So it's like you wash your hands and all of a sudden you don't fall sick every week, right? So you do one thing like hygiene of your hands, but at the same time it fixes a lot of other things. That's another thing on, um, this is text to speech as opposed to speech to text. This is free. You, you can actually download, I've downloaded things which are quite good and I use it myself, but you can actually type, children can type, my name is Anya or whatever, Sam. And the avatar, this a moving avatar, I just put a picture here, but it's actually moving, can say the name. Isn't it fun? It's fun. You don't believe me? Try it one day. Anyway, in a portfolio, I would like to see the things that you actually have explored what is out there, as opposed to say, I use an iPhone and there's nothing critical about it. There's no sign of literacy. Anybody can use an iPhone. Doesn't make you yet a literate person. Doesn't make you actually show to me that you know that using iPhone has anything to do with literacy or at least the literacy definition that you will post for me on the homepage. All right, and I put this link in this PowerPoint so that you can actually find those things. Have you seen that? All right, you will not know probably because I know it because I'm in language teaching, so I know these things. Do you, I teach you word to text and text to word, but whatever, that to speech. The point is, do you know that you can actually make your word document talk to you? You knew that? Because you're ESL. Anybody else know it? Anyway, you didn't know it? It always was that. It's always called differently. Nowadays it's called speak. Before it used to be called voice command or something like that, or, or comment, voice comment. Sorry. But look at it. 
that's the video. So basically, the, I, I included in this PowerPoint the video, but I'll just run it. So this is how you find it. I already have it here, right? But that's how you find it. You go to more commands, then you look for commands not in the ribbon, then you look for speak. You done with it, Anya? You go for speak, and then you select it, you click on add, and it will be here. And look what it does. Come on, Anya. <laughs> so you select. Digital future and new learning. You can slow it down actually in other, I don't know whether in the here. Tools have changed. Digital futures and new learning. The exponential growth of technology has resulted. The tools have changed. While not quite flat or egalitarian yet, has changed. The exponential growth of technology has resulted in the creation of a world which, while not quite flat or egalitarian yet, has changed how people create, gather and assess what counts as knowledge. Present advances in technology and, especially, in communication. Anyway, <laughs> that was the reference to my voice. Anyway, so, how can you use it with little children? What can they select? Anything. They can select half of a word and the thing will read it to them. Just won't be able to read it. But they will learn how much, how much, actually, they will learn the concept of the word. Because if they select only half of the word, only either half of the word will be read, with no meaning, or the whole thing. They learn that if you actually select, and you can actually, rather than go to the big book and read it for children and they hear your voice again and again and again and again. As I said, copy and paste a text from Google about some book, make decoration and make the thing. You can actually, children can, oh, I forgot this is something else. Children can actually select for themselves and learn how to read by actually controlling and ident by basically selecting what they will be reading. So for example, if they select only this, only this will be read. They're learning a lot of concepts, like the text is long. It's coherent. If you only look at one thing, one thing pops out and they get nothing out of the story. 